For over 30 years, Anime Expo has become one of the most iconic anime events in the world, drawing crowds of hundreds of thousands. People travel from all over the world just to experience the magic that is AX. It has a rich history steeped in LA's culture and... Yeah, you don't care about that, do you? You you just like anime titties? Anime titties have been a mainstay of the anime community for over 40 years, dating back to Urusei Yatsura with Lum and... Wait, I'm actually at Anime Expo. Why am I talking about anime titties? Alright, so the history of AX is honestly pretty complicated, starting all the way back in 1991 with AnimeCon 1991. <laughs> Before we can even begin to talk about AnimeCon 91, we need to talk about the state of anime in the US at the time. It like, didn't exist. I mean, of course it did, but it had nowhere near the same amount of mainstream success it does today, or even the same success it would have just five years later. Let's just say it wasn't exactly airing on TV, unless you were being hooked up by my boy at KTEH, Tom Finella. Uh, Sakura Wars has not been broadcast anywhere else in the US previously, so once again, KTEH has done something that no one else in broadcasting in the United States of America has done, and that's to bring you an anime series that has not been seen here before. Anime's storied history in the states begins in the 1960s with shows like Speed Racer, Astro Boy, and moving forward to the 1980s, children's anime would be aired on Nickelodeon and Nick Jr. like The Little Bits, Maple Town, Maya the Bee, and eventually HBO would begin airing anime dubs as well, adapting Bonjour Galaxy Express 999, and more importantly, Hayao Miyazaki's Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, which had its name changed to Warriors of the Wind. All of these dubs are infamous, especially with the original creators of the anime themselves, for being extremely unfaithful and in general just being too cut down to properly enjoy. In the later years of the 80s, attempts would be made to dub Akira Toriyama's Dragon Ball, but this would go down in flames after Harmony Gold's dub failed to see ratings. The shows that actually ended up being successful in America were things like Transformers or the aforementioned Speed Racer, which would gain a cult following over the years. The only company that seemed interested in presenting anime in its original state was Animego, who would license anime officially and subtitle them as well as dub them, and then release them on VHS and Laserdisc. We wouldn't see shows like Sailor Moon, Dragon Ball Z, or Pokemon until years later, and these are really the shows that kicked off the anime boom in the West. All of this is to say that in 1991, anime was an extremely niche thing that only nerds, or as they'd later be referred to as otaku, would be into. There was no unifying show like Attack on Titan or Demon Slayer for everyone to cling on to, so everyone was kind of into their own thing. One could argue Urusei Yatsura was the show a lot of Western anime fans knew about. But you really had to be into it, and not everyone was buying the official anime ego or US rendition dubs or subs. Those just didn't come out frequently enough, and they couldn't license every show under the sun either. So what did people do to get their fill of anime? They'd buy bootleg, unofficial subbed VHS straight from Japan, or wherever they could buy them from really, and even then, most of the time it just wouldn't be subbed at all. They'd just watch the show not understanding what was happening. There was big demand for anime, and the market in the US just wasn't big enough to provide. So yeah, most people would just pirate shit. I mean, it's not too far off from today, honestly, there were just 10 times the amount of steps. That was a massive tangent, but a necessary one. Just imagine being an American otaku, Oh god, not that American otaku. And you finally found a group of people with your same interest that you can just talk to about this stuff. If you seriously told people you like Japanese cartoons, they'd make fun of you. And that's before you've even brought up your waifu or your exclusive animego Urusei Yatsura shirt that says, let's face it, I'm addicted to lum. So, it's 1991 and you live in San Jose, California. Also, you're addicted to lum. <laughs> いい音しか残れない。マクセル。
AnimeCon 91 was held in San Jose, California and ran from August 30th to September 2nd, being the fourth ever anime convention in the United States. It holds the distinction of being the first anime convention that was actually backed by the anime industry, along with being the first anime convention in California. It was backed, and mostly owned, by a young Gainax years before their major breakthrough Neon Genesis Evangelion would release, as they wanted something like Daikon but in the West. In 1983 and 1984, Gainax was essentially formed out of a group of young amateur animators who created created an opening animation for the Daikon convention in Japan. These opening animations were a huge success and directly led to the Gainax we know today. At the Daikon convention, they were able to sell VHS and Laserdisc copies of the animations to a fairly decent profit. Seeing that profit, it would make sense that they'd want to seek out a new audience in the West. They did so with Studio Proteus, a manga distributor, and the creators of Baycon, the Bay Area's longest running science fiction convention. Guests included Hideaki Anno, Kenichi Sonoda, who worked on Bubblegum Crisis, Yoshiyuki Sadamoto from Gainax, Haruhiko Mikimoto, considered to be one of the greatest character designers of all time, and Katsuhiro Otomo, the creator of, oh, I don't know, Akira. Leave me alone! Ah! Akira! Ah! As well as many others. This lineup was truly mind-blowing at the time, as no American anime convention was ever able to snag any people that were actually in the anime industry, and this lineup was way better than what you'd get at actual Japanese conventions like Komiket or the Nihon SF Taikai conventions. In addition to many panels like the hilariously dated subs vs. dub panel, there was also a healthy selection of things to purchase in the dealer's hall. Anime fans were blowing their life savings on real, legitimate anime cells because they didn't know when they'd get a chance to again. This was before the days of the internet, so outside of traveling to Japan itself, for a lot of people it was now or never to get rare merch and sells of their favorite anime. So the dealers were making money hand over fist, and for a couple of American-run distribution companies, they were proving that there was a serious market for Japanese animation and manga in the West. For a lot of attendees, this was even the first time they were able to watch anime in a higher quality than bootlegs, as they were showing anime on 16 and 35 millimeter film. For 24 hours a day, they would screen over 200 plus titles on a theater screen, as well as on two of the hotel's TV channels. Apparently, since a lot of the anime they were showing at the event wasn't subtitled, they would just give out scripts and you'd read along as it was playing. Since anime hadn't really made its way here in 1991, a lot of guests wouldn't have a clue about like 90% of the shows that would be on display. Well, that's where the Anime Con 19 1991 reference guide comes into play. It essentially has a synopsis of each show written out that you'd read to understand what was going on around you. Honestly, this thing feels like a huge time capsule. It's filled with pictures and character designs, which would be helpful to somebody who hasn't seen the show before. And it gives me this weird sense of nostalgia, even though I wasn't even close to being born yet. The front cover features Nadia, which is what Gainax was working on at the time, and partway through the book, there's this great section meant for collecting autographs from the various guests. Unfortunately, my copy is empty, but some have been lucky enough to pick up copies online only to find drawings from Anno. Honestly, if you can find a copy of this online, pick it up. It gives some great insight to how anime was perceived back then. It was a time when anime fans hardly knew what was happening on screen even if they could find the shows. Guides like this helped them understand. Another thing that was sort of new for the time but we take for granted now was the cosplay masquerade, although the word cosplay hadn't come into popular use quite yet. And there's plenty of footage of this online. Gainax reported that attendance was around 3,000, though Animag, a contemporary anime news magazine, would claim it was closer to 1,700. While it seemed like AnimeCon 91 was a huge success, it certainly was for the dealers, behind the scenes many poor financial decisions were made. Like for instance, springing for a chrome trim on the program guide, but yeah. AnimeCon 91 straight up went bankrupt. The business model they set up was unsustainable and it led to the downfall of an extremely promising event. The staff of AnimeCon wanted to keep it going however, so they broke off and formed the SPJA, or the Society for the Promotion of Japanese Animation. Eventually, they would buy out Anime Corp and assume its debt and take control over the name AnimeCon. But for their follow-up convention, they chose to go with a different name, picking Anime Expo. <laughs> To say that Anime Expo 1992 was set up to be a failure would be an understatement. Mike Tatsugawa, chairman of AnimeCon 91 and later CEO of the SPJA, put down his college tuition for the hotel for Anime Expo 92. After that though, there's just not that much out there. I'm gonna be real. There's so much information about AnimeCon 91 out there because the founding members of the SPJA and a couple people who were actually there held a panel about it during AX Offline 2021, which we'll get to in a bit. But after that, the majority of information about the following anime expos are through home videos on YouTube. 
You can find footage of every single AX from any year you want. Hell, you can still find AnimeCon 91 footage if you so desired. Putting that aside, let's talk about what we do know. AX 1992, 1993, 1994, and 1995 all had opening animations similar to Daikon 3 and 4. Honestly, it's really cool looking back at these things. Like I've talked about before in the Bunny Girl video, you can tell how much the otaku that put these together cared. This was a simpler time in the anime community, a time before you'd be bullied for liking anime. We've seen such a weird shift in the past few years where anime fans relentlessly attack each other, and it's just nice to be reminded of a time where it wasn't like that. Going back to the reference guides, I've got one here from AX1993. Honestly, there's something so surreal about seeing Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon being talked about before they ever came to the West. Here they're talking about the Cell Saga long before the Saiyan Saga would ever begin to air. On a side note, there's a couple ads on the back page, one for LA Hero, an anime VHS distributor, and another for Garage Kits. And yeah, that's kind of the cherry on top, isn't it? I think this is going to be a problem for me, because now I want to start collecting all the reference guides. Anime Expo would continue to run smoothly all throughout the 90s, and once we hit the new millennia, they'd even be held outside of California. In 2002, Anime Expo New York was held in the Times Square district, and in 2004, Anime Expo Tokyo was held in, well, Tokyo. These two events weren't particularly failures or anything, but there hasn't been an AX outside of California since, so take that however you want. It's not until we hit 2020 that the story begins to shift a bit. You know the drill. Giant pandemic, blah blah blah. So for 2020 and 2021, Anime Expo was held online with Anime Expo Lite. It also only lasted two days compared to AX's usual four, and yes, you still had to buy tickets. It would be streamed online, and you had to select which channel you'd want, presumably for different panels and such. Moving past Without the dark times, time. AX would return in full swing for 2022, and that I can tell you about from first-hand experience. It was my first AX, and it was kind of a shit show. They didn't cap ticket sales, so there were just too many people. At one point, the fire marshal showed up and blocked people from entering because it would create a fire hazard. Besides all that, I didn't really get into any good panels or anything. God knows I tried to get into the trash taste panel, but as luck would have it, I was the cutoff point in line where they told people they were full. I really enjoyed my time at AX 2022, even if all I did was buy things. In the same year, they also held AX Chibi in Ontario, California, and I went to that one as well. There were no panels, and it was essentially just the artist alley and exhibit hall for two days. And I was pretty much broke, so I couldn't buy much. To be fair, there was a retro gaming room, an arcade, and a manga lounge, the latter being my favorite thing from the whole convention. But yeah, this really didn't need to be two days long, and honestly, you could do just about everything in one day. And that brings us to now, Anime Expo 2023. And what better way to tell you than to give you a tour? Walking up to the convention center, and you'll see lines. But that's okay, because you're cool like me and got your badge shipped to you in the mail. Let's head in. More lines. Alright, I'm seeing a pattern here. So Anime Expo is not the plucky little fan convention it used to be, oh no. It's now the biggest anime convention in the world with over 100,000 guests per year. With this year being 160,000. Jesus. Every day I was at the con, I got there around 6.30 or 7 in the morning, and even then, on one of the days, I didn't get in until like 10.30. To say there was a shit ton of people there is a bit of an understatement. Walking into the south entrance and you'll be greeted by... Grimace? Oh god. Oh god! Every anime expo starts with the opening ceremony. This year's was pretty good, although I have no footage since recording was prohibited. There were several live performances as well as sneak peeks at events that would be happening in the following days. Something I couldn't resist recording, however, was a mascot of Kuromi performing an idol song. Take away my badge if you must, AX. Unfortunately, I won't be able to attend the closing ceremony, but if the opening is anything to go off of, it should be the perfect bookend to this year's AX. And from there, the convention's your oyster. Head on over to the exhibit hall to pick up anime goods, figures, games, manga, see the newest anime video games on display, promos for new movies. If it's anime related, they have it here. This year was a teensy bit crowded, and by a teensy bit I mean holy mother of god it was impossible to do anything. There were a lot of the same booths from last year, but there were also plenty of new ones. One thing I was glad to see was less foam and plastic weapons booths. There were still some, don't get me wrong, but it's been toned down a bit. I'm gonna be real, I spent a lot of money this year. At least twice as much as last year, and there's gonna be a haul at the end, so stay tuned for that. Thinking about it, I think the exhibit hall is always my favorite part of the convention each year. I've always been a collector, you could probably call it hoarding too, and this is the largest congregation of anime collectibles in the entire world, pretty much. Do I recommend spending $1,700 at Anime Expo yourself? No. But it is what I did. How much is the Nagatoro figure? Two seventy. dollars Alright, thank you. Yeah, that's right. I'll probably come back for it. <laughs> 
From there you can head over to the entertainment hall, this is usually where companies are promoting their new shows or movies, but this year is headlined by Trash Taste. They've got a pretty sizable booth, and yes I did see Connor, blurry proof here. They also had a replica of their set for photo ops, and if you spend over $150 on merch, you could do a gotcha pull and potentially win prizes from merch to black Goku. I don't know who won it, but it needs to be known. In the entertainment hall you can also find gaming setups as well as a cosplay repair station for all your cosplay repair station needs. We also have the Maid Cafe and Butler Cafe, which I am too embarrassed to attend. If you're over 21, there's the Lounge 21 for all your filthy heathen alcohol needs. I'm too much of a lightweight to be trusted around alcohol in public though. There's also the the beer garden. Alright, it really feels like whoever's running this wants everyone to be drunk. There's cosplay meetups, tabletop gaming, autograph sessions, karaoke, the manga lounge, the summer fest, and neon district shows held at the Novo just down the street. There's so much to do here, it's mind-blowing. And that's not even mentioning all the great panels this year. These ones blow last year's out of the water. I attended Bang Zoom's panel, and let me just say they were so informative on not only the dubbing, but also the subbing process. It definitely gives me a new appreciation for dubbed anime. I went to great lengths to see the trash taste boys in person. Giguk and Seadog VA both had panels along with Iron Mouse, and on day two of the convention I spent around eight hours in the JW Marriott just to guarantee a spot in both of these panels. No filming was allowed, but yeah, that didn't stop me just a teensy bit. During the Katakawa panel was also the premiere of Netflix's new anime, My Happy Marriage. Giguk and Seadog VA weren't on stage during the premiere, but they came back out afterwards. Coincidentally, I also saw them shilling some gacha game in the entertainment hall, but they weren't letting people stop to watch. <laughs> ファミリーコンピュータの楽しいカセット情報。シングルス、ダブルスの本格テニスをコンピュータと技比べ。5段階のランクが楽しめます。ピンボール。迫力のフリッパー。スロットマシンのスリル。ポーカーゲームの興